everyone. This is Amanda Borchel Dan. And I'm Jessica Steinberg, your host for Times Will Tell, a weekly podcast from the Times of Israel. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Archaeological Times Will Tell. This is Amanda Borchel Dan, and ahead of Easter, I'm touring the Jerusalem Old City's Church of the Holy Sepulchre with top archaeologist Professor Jody Magnus. Jody is the Keenan Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a classical and biblical archaeologist specializing in the Holy Land from the time of Jesus up to the 10th century. She's just finished a forthcoming book on Jerusalem through the ages from the time of the Jebusites through the reign of Charlemagne. I asked Jody to show me some of the earliest archaeological remains from the site where Christian tradition holds that Jesus was crucified and buried. As we tour the Holy Sepulchre Church and its uh, surroundings, we see parts of the ruins of earlier stages of the church, including a find from when it was built by Constantine in around 330 CE. For much of the tour, we are standing next to praying pilgrims. This is Holy Week, after all. So to respect them, at times we're almost whispering apologies. Jody begins our tour by explaining the importance of the Holy Sepulchre Church in the context of the new religion of Christianity that was grafted onto many of Judaism's traditions. One of the things that that Christianity does is it lays claim to the Israelite tradition, right? The Christianity claims to be the true Israel, right? So what happens with the Temple Mount then in, you know, in under Christian rule, when Jerusalem comes under Christian rule from the time of Constantine on? Before the time of Constantine, un- under Hadrian, there apparently was some sort of a temple or shrine dedicated to Capitoline Jupiter, who was the new patron deity of the city on top of the Temple Mount. Again, this is the source of a lot of debate about exactly what Hadrian had on top of the Temple Mount, but I am one of the people who subscribes to the view that there was some sort of a Capitolium structure on the Temple Mount. When Jerusalem became a Christian city, uh, whatever structure was up there at that point was removed. When Christianity became the legal religion of the Roman Empire um, and and Jerusalem became, you know, came under Christian rule, uh, whatever was on the Temple Mount at that point was torn down and the Temple Mount was left lying in ruins uh, until in the 7th century, you know, the the Umayyads build uh, their structures on top of the of the Temple Mount. The Christians deliberately left the Temple Mount lying in ruins because they saw this as a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that the temple would be destroyed. And therefore, it, it bolstered this Christian supersessionist view that Christianity had replaced Judaism as the true Israel, right? And so what happens then is that with the construction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre by the first emperor who, you know, legalized Christianity, Constantine, the focal point religiously of the city moves from the Temple Mount to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This spot becomes the center of the world, not the Temple Mount. And in fact, uh, the the when the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built, many of the traditions that were associated with the Temple Mount were moved to the area of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. For example, we have early Christian sources that talk about Golgotha, the rocky outcrop on which Jesus is believed to have been crucified, that that was Mount Moriah, that this is the spot where Abraham offered his son for sacrifice, not the Temple Mount, that the um, that the structure, the edicule that enclosed the tomb, that that was analogous to the Holy of Holies in the temple, and that, you know, the, the priest would enter that on specific occasions. So a lot of those traditions became moved to here. And for Christians, this then becomes the center of the world. Was it a pilgrimage site as well? Oh, it was absolutely, it was a huge pilgrimage site. I mean, that was one of the big points of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that it it attracted. So, you know, when Christianity became uh, the legal religion of the Roman Empire, and, you know, this church was built and other churches were built, uh, Jerusalem was catapulted into a position of prominence that it had not had for a long time. Because even though we talk a lot about Hadrian's city of Aelia Capitolina. But for the Romans, Jerusalem was, you know, a, a minor, you know, provincial little backwater. But for Christians, this is, you know, this is the center of the world. I mean, this is this is the spot where, you know, Jesus spent his final days on earth. 
And so, uh, so Jerusalem actually during the Byzantine period, so we're talking now fourth, fifth, sixth centuries, becomes uh, one of the only patriarchate cities in the Roman Empire. There were only five patriarchate cities, the seat of a patriarch. Jerusalem becomes one of them. And so huge numbers of pilgrims are flock to the city, as well as all sorts of other people, monks, priests, nuns, convents and monasteries are built all over the place. Um, there's a lot of imperial patronage through the fourth, fifth, and sixth century. So the the successors of Constantine were also Christian rulers, also endowed lots of churches and, and monastic establishments and and also um, uh, hostels for pilgrims and things like that. So absolutely, money poured in. The city prospered. In fact, during the Byzantine period, Jerusalem reached a size that it would not reach again until the 20th century. It is one of the high points in the history of the city of Jerusalem. We begin our tour of the original Holy Sepulchre compound in a Russian Orthodox church, the Alexander Nevsky Church, which is right next to the Holy Sepulchre Church. It was built over some of the remains, including a wall constructed from stones dating to King Herod. Could this be the famous city gate that Jesus walked through? We'll talk about that. There was a nun praying there, so as we approach her, we speak a little quietly. I appreciate your patience. Okay, Jody, let us know where we are right now. Yes. So we're in the um, Alexander Nevsky Church, also called the Russian Alexander Hospice, which is located to the east of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, it's a really interesting building. It was purchased by the Russian Orthodox Church after the Crimean War in 1859. And um, they then hired, before they constructed the church, they hired Konrad Schick, who was a very well-known architect in Jerusalem in the mid-19th century and also uh, worked in archaeology. Um, they hired him to come and, and uh, explore what was found here. And so the remains that we're going to see here were found at that time. Um, we're also going to see that some of the remains were misidentified by Schick as part of the second wall and the significance of that. Basically, what we have here is located between the line of the main or western cardo of Roman Jerusalem, Roman Byzantine Jerusalem, on the east, and then on the west, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this is an area which originally was part of Constantine's Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which extended all the way to the Cardo. So originally, and this is what you see on the Madaba map, um, Constantine's Church of the Holy Sepulchre was entered from the Cardo. You came down the main or western Cardo from what where is now Damascus Gate, and then you know went up steps and then directly entered into the church, which was a huge basilica. Um, and then behind the church was a circular dome structure, the rotunda or anastasis, which which enclosed the the tomb. Um, Give us a year on that. Yeah, that would have been in well, okay. So we'll get to the church, but that would have been roughly three thirty uh, CE. So that church, Constantine's church, was destroyed eventually. Actually, there's a whole big story behind that too, but it was it was basically dismantled in the 11th century. And when the Crusaders came and rebuilt the church, which is what you see today, what you see today is a product of the Crusader reconstruction in the 12th century. When the Crusaders rebuilt the church, this area that's now the Russian Alexander Hospice was left outside the church. And so what we have here in the basement of the Russian Alexander Hospice are remains associated with the original Constantinian Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, it's more than that, though, because because there's early remains than that. Because before Constantine's time, when Hadrian rebuilt Jerusalem as Aelia Capitolina, Roman Jerusalem in the 2nd century CE, here on the western side of the city, he established a forum, a marketplace, which was a big open paved space. It was entered through a monumental triple arched gateway, and right behind us here are the remains of that monumental triple arched gateway, which is which is similar to the uh, gateway at the Damascus Gate, under the Damascus Gate, and also the Arch of Ekehoma, which is part of a monumental triple arched gateway that marks the entrance to Hadrian's northern forum to the north of the Temple Mount. So here... Here we have the um, a triple arch gateway that, that marked the entrance into the Western Forum that was established by Hadrian in the second century. And on the north side of the Forum, that is on the north side of this large open paved space, Hadrian built two structures. 
on the east side, immediately adjacent to the Cardo, a Roman-style basilica, meaning a large rectangular public building with the long side facing towards the forum. And then to the west of it, or behind it, a temple that was dedicated, well, probably to Aphrodite Venus. There's a debate about it because some scholars think that the temple was actually the Capitolium of Aelia Capitolina, where uh, Capitoline Jupiter was worshipped. Um, I subscribe to the school of thought that it was dedicated to uh, Aphrodite Venus. Um, that temple, Hadrian's temple, according to tradition, was built over the uh, tomb of, of Christ. And so when Constantine came, in the 4th century, in the early 4th century, and built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre here, what he did was to take Hadrian's Basilica, this big monumental public building, and convert it into a Christian basilica, a Christian hall of worship, and he then tore down the uh, temple to expose the tomb of Christ and encircled it and shrined it within a circular building called the Rotunda, or originally called the Anastasis. So at any rate, what we have here, what's so important, is that here we have most of what's left of the original Constantinian Basilica um, and, of course, the earlier original remains of Hadrian's uh, Western Forum. So just to clarify, the rotunda, which is meant to be where the tomb actually was, is that here or in no, the Holy that's Sepulchre? Right. The, so the, that's right. So the rotunda is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's located on the west side of the church. And now we are to the east of the church complex, outside it, in an area that originally was part of the Constantinian Basilica. So it's really great if you take a look at the Madapa map. You can see it very clearly, very prominently. You you would what you would do is enter Jerusalem through the northern gate, which is where the Damascus gate is today, and walk directly south along the western cardo, lined by columns. And then at some point, you turned off to the west to enter the church. The church was entered by way of steps. You entered the basilica, which was Constantine's basilica, but originally Hadrian's basilica. And then behind it to the west is the dome of the rotunda, which is where the tomb is. So we'll, we'll get to that afterwards. But let's take a look at the remains here first. You can see that the basilica is built of reused Herodian-style stones, which is one of the hallmarks of Hadrian's buildings in Aelia Capitolina, because when Hadrian rebuilt Jerusalem as Aelia Capitolina in the second century, the city had been lying in ruins for some 60 to 65 years. So according to the gospel accounts, Jesus, when he was crucified, was taken out of the city. He was taken through a gate in the wall of the city and led out and crucified on a hill outside the walls. So if the second wall then was the wall of the city, presumably Jesus would have been led through that line of wall and taken out and crucified. This relates to the question of the authenticity of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, because does the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in fact mark the spot where Jesus was crucified and buried? And it's it's impossible to prove that archaeologically. But if this was the line of the second wall, as Schick thought it was, then it would prove that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre lay outside the walls of the city in the time of Jesus. That was the significance, because the church lies to the west, right? And so that's why, and the tomb lies to the west. So that's why there was such excitement about this. And you can see that now the um, the uh, church has a huge shrine set up with a kind of a rocky outcrop on that threshold showing a crucified Jesus. And the significance is that they venerate this as the spot where Jesus was let out of the city to be crucified. That's why they have that up there. That's why they have somebody here praying right now. You can go around and look at the other side of the basilica. Where we are now just seems like such an amalgamation of different styles and periods. Am I reading that right? Sure, because what they did is they uncovered these earlier remains, and then they're a little bit restored, and then they built their church around it, right? The church, by the way, is a really interesting church because, of course, this is the white Russian church, right? The, the pre-revolutionary church of Russia, right? The Russian Orthodox, but pre, pre-revolution, so the white Russian church. Um, and... Uh, you can see here some columns, pieces of columns, and there's a place here, no entrance, but if you peek through there, if you look in there, you can see some of the columns that lined the cardo. It's so funny because if you look up, um, so you have all the Herodian style stones, and then you look up and it looks like a Venetian opera house. <laughs> yeah. 
We left the Alexander Nevsky Church and then we stood outside the Holy Sepulchre compound while Jody gave some background and placed us on the map of the old city. We'll hear what she has to say after a short break. So um, to orient us, when you go into Damascus Gate today, you enter kind of an open space. You're, you're actually entering right above the original Roman Gate of Aelia Capitolina from the time of Hadrian, 2nd century. And when you go in, there's kind of like an open area that's filled with vendors and things like that, which is above the open oval plaza that was inside the gate at the time of Hadrian. How far above, Jody? I, I saw a reconstruction of the uh, digs that were done mm-hmm. there recently. It yeah. seems, what, two meters at least? At right? least. What's happened is, is that the ground level has risen since antiquity, but the original oval plaza is somewhere below where, where you walk in today. If we put it in the context of the crucifixion and things like that, where people now enter is not where Jesus would have uh, been, or is that is that not a leap that you can make? Oh, okay. Well, the, the authenticity of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a whole other thing, right? Um, so, look, so... Uh, so as we just saw in the Russian Alexander Hospice in the Alexander Nevsky Church, um, uh, you know, Schick thought he had found the second wall, and that would have uh, that wouldn't have proven the authenticity of the church, but at least it would have indicated that the church definitely lay outside the line of the second wall. We don't have any remains that that everybody agrees belong to this belong to the second wall. So the second wall debate is when you see reconstructions of the second wall, it's always just hypothetical, and and there's no agreement about exactly where it was. So we don't have that piece of evidence. Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built about about uh, 300 years after the time of Jesus. And um, it, it's actually one of the earliest churches that was ever built because it was Constantine who legalized Christianity for the first time in the Roman Empire until the time of Constantine, until the Edict of Milan in 313 CE. Christianity was an illegal outlawed religion in the Roman Empire. And therefore, Christians could not worship openly before the time of Constantine, which means we don't have any churches before the time of Constantine because they had to worship in secret. So the churches that Constantine built, which include very prominently the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, therefore, are the earliest churches that were ever built in the Roman Empire. Um, That means that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre goes back as far as you can go in Christian tradition. Uh, But you still have a 300-year gap. So, So many scholars think that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre likely is the authentic spot where Jesus was crucified and buried because the tradition is so ancient. But you still have that 300-year gap, which is a leap of faith that archaeology cannot cross, right? So um, so there's that. Uh, when we go into the church, I will show you what is, I think, the best piece of archaeological evidence for the authenticity of the church, even though it doesn't prove it. But I will, I will show you something when we get inside. Let's go there now. Yeah. <laughs> We walked to the courtyard of the Holy Sepulchre, where we were surrounded by Holy Week pilgrims and even a surprising tractor-trailer combination that entered the church before us. Let me explain, first of all, what we're looking at here, and then we can can go in. So right now we're we're in a big open courtyard in front of the main entrance to the church. The entrance to the church that we see here is the Crusader entrance. So to, to back up a little bit, so Constantine built his church you know, based on the reuse of the Hadrianic Basilica. He did that in the early 4th century and enshrined the tomb within, you know, a, a circular dome structure. Today it's called the Rotunda. Originally it was called the Anastasis, which is Greek word for resurrection. Now, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has suffered a lot of damage over the course of time. Some natural, like earthquakes and fires and things like that. Some of it human, human damage. Uh, the worst. It, it's really amazing to see these mini tractors yeah. navigating the know, uh, right? very small alleyways. And, look. and now we're wondering, is he going to go inside the church? He is. He is, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, amazing. it is amazing. The are great. Yeah. <laughs> so, the worst damage to the church was uh, in the year 1009 AD when a Fatimid caliph named Al-Hakim had uh, ordered the church systematically dismantled from top to bottom. Um, At that point then, all of Constantine's church was torn down except for the rotunda. The rotunda was left standing. That's the only part of the church that's still left today that's that's still standing from the original church. And in fact, it was Al-Hakim's dismantling of the church 
that sparked the Crusades. Um, that sparked the Crusader quest to retake the Holy Land. Um, and one of the goals, one of the main goals of the Crusades was to reconstruct, re, you know, rebuild the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, after, after 1009, the, um, the uh, Muslim rulers granted the Byzantines in Constantinople permission to rebuild the church on a very small scale. And what they did basically was to build a sort of an open courtyard with some chapels adjacent to the rotunda. And that's what the crusaders found when they took the city in 1099 and then subsequently rebuilt the church. Now, when the crusaders rebuilt the church then in the 12th century, so they're coming from Western Europe, they built the church in their native of style, which means basically in a kind of a Western European, late Romanesque, early Gothic style. And that's exactly what you see here. So basically, the church as you see it today, despite, you know, some modifications, is the Crusader Church. And what we're walking into, when you walk into here on the south side, is the original Crusader entrance, which consisted of two monumental doorways, one of which is blocked up now. Um, originally, they had carved lintels over them, showing scenes from the life of Jesus, which have been removed and which are in the Rockefeller Museum. Right. And then you have a couple of windows above, right? Um, and you can see that there's a lot of there's a lot of Romanesque, uh, late Romanesque, early Gothic kind of style here in the clustering of the columns, the the carvings, and and the way that you have the the um, windows and the doorways recessed with all of these elaborate carvings around them. It's very typical of that style. There's also a very interesting element here, which you can see running. It's it's this sort of carved uh, horizontal, yeah, like a cornice kind of a thing, um, or an entablature, sort of running across. Uh, vertically, and it also separates the bottom story of the facade from the top story, and it looks kind of late Roman in style, and there are theories that maybe that's from the original Constantinian church, repurposed, um, repurposed wow. exactly, built back, built in. Now, um, uh, immediately to our right, or to the right of the entrance, is a chapel with a little dome, which is the the Chapel of Golgotha, or Calvary in Latin, which is the rocky outcrop on which Jesus is believed to have been crucified. Originally, in Constantine's church, that was simply a rocky outcrop that had a little sort of edicule or building on top of it. Um, but now, of course, the whole thing is enclosed within a chapel, and when you walk up, you have to walk up steps. When you go inside immediately to the right, there's these narrow steps that go up. When you get up to the top, you can see part of that rocky outcrop behind glass, um, and you'll see that the chapel like everything else in the church is divided between different Christian, between different denominations. So on one side you have the Roman Catholic part of the chapel and on the other side you have the Greek Orthodox and that's also one of the things that makes the church so fascinating which is of course it's sacred to so many Christians around the world that you have many different Christian denominations that have uh, that have custody over different parts of the church um, most of the church now is uh, in the control of the Greek Orthodox but the Roman but the Catholics also have a very substantial part but there are also um, there's also a very substantial portion that's Armenian and then you have here um, the Egyptian Copts and you have the Ethiopian in fact, right behind us here, uh, op opening onto the courtyard, is a, is the Ethiopian church, and they have a monastery on top, and uh, actually on the roof of the church, um, so that there are all these different, you know, Christian denominations. As you walk in, you'll see a, a large sort of flat red stone that people are venerating, which is venerated as the spot on which Jesus's body was placed after he was removed from the cross. Um, and then... Uh, on the other side of that stone is a large wall, and that wall continues around to the right, and we're going to continue with it. So uh, as we walk in, here's that, that stone that I told you, and you can see that, you know, you often how see it's, people kissing it. Yeah, you see people like, kneeling, and that's right, exactly. And immediately off to the, to the right of it is a little doorway that leads into another chapel. I have to say, personally, this is one of my favorite chapels. I always come in here. Do you know it, what it is? I have no idea oh, yeah, what it it's is. It's the Chapel of Adam. Really? So we are under the Rock of Golgotha. And you can actually see part of the Rock of Golgotha here behind glass. And um, there's a Christian tradition that, uh, that, that Adam was buried underneath here. And that when, uh, that when Jesus was crucified on top of Golgotha, his blood flowed through this crack that you see in the rock and resurrected Adam. And so this is the Chapel of Adam. It's a very interesting chapel because you can see the brickwork here, which is characteristic of the Greek 
reconstruction, the, the Byzantine Greek reconstruction in the 11th century, and then you can see some of the original crusader the columns and capitals invasion. here. That's right. These are crusaders. So this is this is an area that preserves some of the very early construction. This, by the way, is another tradition that was moved uh, from the Temple Mount because there was a Jewish tradition that Adam was buried under Mount Moriah. Mm -hmm. And so this was moved to here, again, with a lot of the other temple traditions to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And like the Western Wall, there are all sorts of little notes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's right. And And when you walk out of here... You can see more of the Rock of Golgotha behind glass. And, of course, they've had to cover these with glass because over the centuries, pilgrims who have come here have chipped away at the rock to take home little sacred souvenirs, right? Blessings. So as we walk around the, um, the apse here, you can see these, they're, they're these little radiating chapels. Actually, there's three of them, each one dedicated to somebody else. But again, this is what you see in, in this late Romanesque style of architecture, which multiplies in the Gothic period, right? In, in Gothic architecture, you get lots and lots of these little chapels radiating off of the ambulatory. Here, we're in late Romanesque, so you only have three of them. Now, this, on the opposite side, is the outside of the, of the Crusader uh, nave, right? This is the apse of the Crusader nave. And notice it's facing uh, east, right? So east is, is towards the Cardo. Um, in the original Church of Constantine, the apse of the church faced west, and it's below this apse. It's underneath. So some of the remains that we have from the original Church of Constantine are under here, and they kind of overlap, right? in each way. The, um, it wasn't usual in early Christianity to have the apse of the church, which is the direction of prayer, face west. The usual was to have it face east. Here, it faced west in order to face the tomb. But when the Crusaders rebuilt their church and they built it right, right up against the rotunda, they reoriented the apse in the opposite direction. So, um, so this chapel, well, let's go down to this one at least. This is, this is like brand new, right? But, it, but there's an interesting thing about it. I think there's an interesting thing about every single corner here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a fascinating building. Fascinating. Right. So, um, so this chapel, which is, you can see it's brand new, and the mosaic is brand new. I mean, this is, you know, uh, it's, it's a, an Armenian chapel dedicated to St. Vartan. Uh, but there's a door that opens off of it, which unfortunately is not open to the public over there. Uh, and that door leads into a quarry. So all of this area, again, was quarried out originally. And, and if you go down further, there's another set of stairs here that goes to... You can actually see right, how it's all quarried out, yeah. right? So this, if you go all the way to the bottom, that's the chapel where St. Helena, the mother of Constantine, is believed to have found the remains of the true cross, which is then why Constantine comes and builds the Church of the Holy Sepulchre here. That's actually a later tradition, but she is said to have, that is said to have happened in 323, and then Constantine comes in 326 and starts to build the church, and the church was then consecrated in 335 CE. Um, so, so all of this you know, area, these are parts of these quarries that then when Constantine builds the church here, the church is built pretty much over these quarried out areas, and they're used for various purposes. Originally, these were used as the, at least the one down below where, where the cross was supposedly found was a cistern in, in Constantine's time. But what's interesting is that if you, if you could go through that door over there on the side of the Chapel of St. Vartan, you would get into an area where you clearly see the quarry the quarried out stone, you see where they, there are these sort of shelves of the stones having been removed. But the most interesting thing is there are remains in there of part of the original stylobate of the Constantinian church. The stylobate, right, so the stylobate is the um, foundation for the columns in the nave of the church. So the church, Constantine's church, was this big, the basilica part of the church, right, was, was a big rectangular building that had uh, two rows of columns on either side of the nave, so four rows of columns in all, and terminated in a big semicircular apse or, or niche that faced the direction of the tomb. 
So what you have in there is uh, part of uh, the foundations of the columns. The columns had to stand on foundations where they would stick in the earth, they would sink into the earth. So you would have a stone wall that supported the columns, and that's what a stylobate is. So you asked about the level of the church, right? So this would give you the indication of where the level of the church was in the time of Constantine, as well as the remains in the Alexander Nevsky Church. So first of all, there are some remains of the original Constantinian uh, basilica in there, but more importantly, um, incised onto the plaster of, of that stylobate is um, a very interesting graffito, which is, it shows a ship, and there's an inscription in Latin which says, Domine Iwimus, which means, Lord, we went. And it's, it dates to before the construction of the church, because the foundations were not visible once the church was constructed. And so presumably it was incised onto the plaster there around the time the church was being constructed by a very early Christian pilgrim who wrote Domine Iwimus, which may be a reference to Psalm 121, 122, depending on which numbering you use, um, which talks about, Lord, we have, we have, we went to your house or we have, we have come to your house or something like that. So, um, so at any rate, what we have here apparently is is evidence of very early Christian pilgrimage to this spot, even before the Church of Constantine was built. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. And by somebody who was a Latin speaker, right. meaning coming from a different part of the Mediterranean. Right. Have you been in there? I have been in there, but it's not usually open to the public, right. unfortunately. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. It was it was uh, explored and, and, uh, and investigated by, um, by, by Gabi Barkayi and Magin Broshi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. To Israeli, why would they have been in there? Some kind of salvage excavation? Yeah, there was some, they were doing uh, exploration in there. Yeah, they published wow. it. Yeah. And, and the graffiti, is it still there? It's still there as far as right. I know. It hasn't been removed. As far as I know, it's still there. Wow. I'm, I'm floored by that, actually. Really. It's such a shame we can't get the scent through to the, the I know, there. right? All the uh, <laughs> incense and everything. Oh, right. Yeah. Just the lovely chill air. Well, people need to come and visit. That's right. Right. So we've come around into the rotunda, and the rotunda is this big circular dome structure that enshrines a building called an edicule that enshrines the tomb. The building that enshrines the tomb today, the edicule that you see today, dates to 1809-1810. So it's oh, a it's a modern structure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's a modern structure. There have been different forms of edicules over the tomb over time, but but that's what you see today. So here again, you can see some of this characteristic Greek, the Byzantine brick. Greek, the brickwork. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is as and so I told you this right that. The rotunda was still standing in the 11th century when the Byzantines were given permission to rebuild here on a very small scale. So where we're standing here with the brickwork on either side is part of this courtyard that, the, that they built right up against the rotunda. And opening off of it were, were these chapels that I mentioned. And now it's just under now one it's, roof. And now it's all just part of the, you see it was incorporated into the, um, into the Crusader church. Wow. Yeah. So the rotunda, as you see it today, is, it's again, it's the only part of the original Constantinian church that's still standing, but it too has been changed tremendously over the course of time. Uh, one of the things that happened, and you asked about ground level, is that the ground level has risen. So originally the rotunda was much higher than it is today, but the ground level has risen over time. And one of the consequences of the ground level rising is that the columns and the piers that surround the rotunda on the sides now appear very short and truncated because mm -hmm. originally they were tall columns and piers and, and now they're a little scary, stubby, so. short, yeah, <laughs> weird looking. And another thing that uh, has changed is that originally the rotunda, like presumably the rest of the church, would have been richly decorated with colored and, and, and glass and gold mosaics and with, you know, marble veneer and with, you know, all sorts of other characteristic styles of, of uh, decoration in the late Roman and early Byzantine world. And of course, that's all gone as well, as well as the original dome. The dome has been replaced many times. This dome is a very recent dome. So, so really, even though the rotunda is still here, 
it doesn't look anything like it originally looked like. In fact, if you really want to get a good impression of what the rotunda would have looked like in the time of Constantine and, and in the you know couple of centuries after that, go into the church, go into the uh, Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, because the Dome of the Rock actually imitates the rotunda of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it has the same kind of decoration that you would have seen here. The that ceramic? Is, not, not, no, that's the outside. You're thinking of the outside. I'm talking about the inside, inside. right? Okay. The inside, the marble columns, the gilded capitals, um, the, uh, the glass mosaics with a lot of gold, gold leaf, um, the marble veneer. That is what the interior of the rotunda would have been like. I right? haven't been there for 20 years. Yeah, we can't I know, <laughs> I know. But that, that would give you a much better impression of what this originally looked like. Now, the, the major part of the tomb, and, and all this... So, when Constantine came here to build the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the early 4th century, what he found at this spot... So, according to the story, there was a, there was a temple that Hadrian built on this spot, either a temple to Aphrodite Venus or to Jupiter, whatever. But there was a, there was a temple here, and um, Constantine ordered the temple torn down in order to expose the rocky tomb in which Jesus had been laid. What he found here was a sort of a big area of, you know, kind of rocky outcrop into which tombs were cut. And he was shown by the locals, apparently, right? This, these, you know, they pointed, this is the tomb of Jesus. So what he did was to cut back the rock from all around that tomb. So all the rest of the tombs were cut away to leave that one tomb. And that tomb was then enshrined within this little building called the Edicule. Today, if you go into the Edicule, you really see nothing but a, a stone shelf. That's, that's really all you see. But that was what was here. Most of the Edicule that you see today is um, under the control of the Greek Orthodox. But the back part the, uh, the Egyptian cops have a teeny little corner uh, of the tomb, and you can go around to the back, and there's uh, an Egyptian Coptic priest there who's always very happy to show you their side of the tomb. But I want to go back there not to see that, but to see something adjacent to it. Great. Now, when you go inside the tomb, as I did in October, you have to bend down, yeah. which is a, a very right, uh, subservient. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. So if you walk off of the rotunda here, we're actually walking into a chapel. This is a little chapel off of the rotunda. It's an original chapel from the time of Constantine. Uh, it's in the. It's a very. Um, it's a very sad and neglected uh, chapel. Um, it's in the custody of the um, the Syrian Orthodox. Um, but what's so interesting is that opening off of this chapel, you can see that there's a, an opening in the wall that leads to an area outside the walls of the church. And what you have here then is, and let's, I'm going to put on a flashlight. Now, you call it a sad and neglected chapel, but to me it looks like what you would expect, a name of the rose type chapel. Oh, yeah, like. <laughs> yes. No, it's pretty, it's pretty neglected. Um, but if you, if you take a look back here... And I know you know what those are. What do you see? I'll, I'll go in and try. I feel like this is a pop quiz, Professor. I don't... A grating? No, the, those oh, things. Oh, the tombs, the tombs. Those are loculi, right? Now, you know what loculi are. Okay, uh, we can sure, go back out. Let's go out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what's the significance of this? Um, the, the Christian, according to tradition, this is the tomb of, of uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, right? Because Joseph of Arimathea owned the tomb into which Jesus' body was supposedly laid. So that's what it's called now, popularly. That's a whole other thing, whether that's true or not. But um, the significance is that what we have here just outside the walls of the church is, are the remains of a Jewish cemetery of the late Second Temple period that has loculi in it. Now, that means that this was a Jewish cemetery. There was a Jewish cemetery here in the time of Jesus. Um, this apparently is part of this cemetery that, that Constantine cut back when he built the church. Uh, but and, and these were left because they're outside the walls of the church. But the significance then is that this proves that this was a cemetery in the time of Jesus, and that means that this must have been outside the walls of the city at the time of Jesus. So that's the closest that archaeology comes to sort of establishing the authenticity of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Archaeology cannot prove that Jesus was laid to rest in one of these tombs here, um, but we can say that the church was apparently outside the walls of the city, and there was a Jewish cemetery here in the time of Jesus. So that's, that's pretty good. 
So Jody, thank you so much for taking us through these two churches. It's fascinating. Tell us a little bit about the project that you're just finishing up yourself. Yeah, so um, I've just finished a manuscript, uh, a book manuscript on um, Jerusalem through the ages, which is under contract with Oxford University Press. Um, which tells the story of the history and archaeology of Jerusalem from the beginning up to the year 800 CE. <laughs> so up to the early Islamic period. It was supposed to go up to the Crusades, but it got too long and I got too tired and I decided to end it there um, with uh, Charlemagne, actually, the time of Charlemagne, which has very interesting connections to Jerusalem. So each chapter, there's a couple of introductory chapters and, you know, the background about the exploration, but um, the chapters basically arranged chronologically, beginning with the quote unquote Jebusite Jerusalem, and then, you know, working our way through, um, focusing on specific uh, years of transition in the history and archaeology of Jerusalem. So hopefully it will be out in a couple of years. I'm waiting now for it to be reviewed and edited. I'm working on the illustrations, so we'll see. Yeah, sounds like there could be easily a part two for that. No, uh, no, no. That's it. I'm not. Uh, no, no. I'm not going beyond that. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> So again, thank you for spending the time with us. It's Holy Week. It's pretty crowded here. Not terribly crowded because of coronavirus, etc. But it's a fantastic day in Jerusalem. And I thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thanks so much for listening to Times Will Tell from the Times of Israel. And thanks to our producer, Gilad Brownstein. Please subscribe wherever you find your podcast and check out our daily briefing news show every Sunday through Thursday. Like what you hear? Consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to spread the word. Until next week, Shalom. Shalom.